Hello, everyone, and welcome to Step Parent Adoption under the Modern Family Act. My name is Denise Watt, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator here at LAC. Today's session is presented by Betsy Lee of the Access Center at the San Francisco Superior Court and Ming Wong of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Before we get started, we wanted to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 1-800-263-6137. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email me at wdatt at blackonline.org, and I will try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send us them using your chat box. This session will be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training, so you will have access to those things in the coming days. And with that, I'll turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Betsy and Ming. Hi, thank you, Denise. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. Uh, my name is Betsy Lee, and I'm a staff attorney at the San Francisco Superior Court Southwell Center, the Access Center. And I um, the Access Center houses the Family Law Facilitator's Office, the Small Claims Advisor's Office, and we provide assistance with civil and family law self-help services, including step-parent adoption. And uh, I joined the court in 2008. Prior to that, I worked at Bay Area Legal Aid, uh, representing survivors of domestic violence and family law matters, and I also worked at Bay Area Legal Aid Legal Advice Live. Um, I am fluent in Cantonese Chinese. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Betsy. Um, hi, this is Ming Wong. I'm um, the Supervising Helpline Attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, or NCLR. NCLR is an organization we've been around since 1977, um, and we work to advance the civil and human rights of LGBT people and their families. Um, one of the projects that I have been working on is working on increasing access to legal services and legal protections for low-income LGBT people. Um, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And one really key way um, that LGBT people and low-income people generally get access to legal information is through programs like the Access Center at the San Francisco Superior Court and the Family Law Facilitators offices all around California. So I'm really honored and happy to be on this webinar and giving sharing this vital information for a lot of um, LGBT people in our state. Um, that hopefully you all will be able to convey to um, people that you come into contact with as well. Um, and NCLR is the first job I've had. I, I started working here in 2008, right after law school and taking the bar. So. Thank you, Ming. So, uh, Denise, you have some poll questions. Yes, we have a few poll questions today. So the first poll question we have for you all in the audience is, have you had experience working with LGBT clients? Yes or no? And we'll give folks just a few seconds to vote. And it looks like pretty much everyone has voted. So we'll close the poll, and 84% say yes, and 16% say no. Our next poll question asks, have you had experience doing adoptions? Yes or no? And it looks like we have 81% say yes, 19% say no. Our third poll question asks, how many years of experience have you had with family law? Zero to two years, two to five years, five to 10 years, or more than 10 years? It looks like pretty much everyone has voted. And we have 9% say 0 to 2 years, 14% say 2 to 5 years, 
27% say 5 to 10 years, and 50% say more than 10 years. And our final poll question asks, I am staff at Family Law Facilitator Self-Help Center, other court staff, judge, attorney, or other non-attorney. Great, 100% response rate. And we have 65% are staff at a Family Law Facilitator Self-Help Center, 13% are other court staff, no judges and no non-attorneys, 22% are attorneys. Great, thanks Denise. Um, well, it looks like we have an, um, an audience that actually has a fair amount of experience with family law, which is really great, um, and also a fair amount of experience working with LGBT clients. Um, so, it's, sorry, this is Ming. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit of background about you know, the necessity for the Modern Family Act. And then I also included some, a few slides about tips um, on working with LGBT clients. Um, but maybe I'll move through that pretty quickly since it sounds like we have a relatively experienced um, audience. And then that'll give Betsy a little more time to get into kind of the nitty gritty of, um, you know, how to actually assist people looking to do the new step parent adoption procedures. Um, made available by the Modern Family Act. So um, I, I first wanted to dispel a few myths about LGBT people and parenting. And I think the biggest myth nationally is that same-sex couples don't have children. And of course, the reality is that one in five same-sex couples are raising children together. And um, for same-sex couples who are married, this is actually, the number goes up to 31%. So that's a fairly high number. The um, couple in this photo is actually um, some clients of NCLR who have kids, and they're, they're based in Florida, um, and we're helping them with a birth certificate issue. But we, I just thought they were a, a lovely family and wanted to include them um, in this slide. So then the second myth, um, kind of a variant of that first myth, is that you know it's really only white um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual people who are trying to have or are um, having children or are parenting. And the reality is actually almost kind of the opposite, that people of color in same-sex couples are more likely um, to be raising children. So in fact, 33% of those who identify as non-white and who are in a same-sex couple were raising children compared to only 18% of those who identified as white and in a same-sex couple. Um, the third myth, and again, kind of a variant on those first two, is that um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual families are wealthy. Um, again, the truth is unfortunately very different from that, and same-sex couples raising children are actually more likely to be low income than different sex couples raising children. So households with same-sex couples raising children under 18 are twice as likely as households with different sex couples raising children to be earning less than $24,000 a year. Um, and you can also see from um, uh, the statistical charts down there that single LGBT adults are also um, uh, near the poverty line at a greater um, rate than married or partnered LGBT adults. And this presentation is going to focus on married same-sex couples or married um, couples, they don't have to be a same-sex couple to access the procedure, but um, I did want to also flag that to kind of highlight that this myth of the wealthy LGB parent is, is also completely false. Um, and then finally, I think there's a myth that um, few or no transgender people have children. Um, and of course, the reality again is very different. In fact, 38% of transgender people are parents, and in addition, um, maybe, this, maybe this is like myth 4.5, the idea that people of color are less supportive of transgender people is also a myth, and in fact, um, polls have found that the families and the children of um, transgender parents of color are actually slightly more likely to be supportive of their transgender parent. And I've included links there if you need to um, look at the sources for any of these statistics. Um, but these can be, um, these sort of myths or dispelling these myths can be a good way to uh, make the case for why it's important 
to make sure that your office is welcoming to LGBT people and to LGBT parents in particular. So, um, and I wanted to touch on why adoption is still important, even though um, now there, you know, marriage is now available to all couples, regardless of the relative genders of the two spouses. Um, and um, as many, it sounds like probably many people on this call know, there, is, there are these strong legal presumptions of parentage in California for a person who is married to or in a registered domestic partnership with a birth parent. Um, the reason why NCLR still thinks that adoption is very important for the non-birth parent and the non-biological parent is that other states, of course, may not have the same legal presumptions or their state laws are unclear on how those presumptions apply if a parent is not a biological parent. Um, getting an adoption, because that adoption is a court order, um, actually is the, pretty much the strongest protection a parent can get for the legal relationship between them and their child, and that adoption must be recognized in every state, even if that other state may not have you know, made an adoption available or may not um, have recognized their parentage otherwise, because they have an adoption from California, um, they will be recognized as a legal parent everywhere else. So, um, I also included a couple of slides just to give a bit of background about marriage in California. So same-sex couples have been able to marry in California since June 28, 2013, um, when a district court, um, sorry, the judgment of the U.S. District Court that struck down Proposition 8, which people may recall was the ballot measure in 2008 that um, banned marriage for same-sex couples. There was also a period, a window in 2008 after the California Supreme Court um, found that it was unconstitutional under our state's constitution to ban same-sex couples from marrying um, and before Prop 8 took effect. And in that window, same-sex couples could also marry. Um, in California also, of course, now and um, actually for a period of time, even before 2013, recognized marriages by same-sex couples validly entered into elsewhere. Um, if a couple, so one thing I did want to flag about that is if you get a couple um, who are a same-sex couple and they indicate that they married in California outside of those times, like maybe before 2008 even, um, it's probably a good idea to refer them to an attorney to make sure that everything about their marriage is okay. Um, in particular, there were a, a number of couples who married in 2004 um, when San Francisco started issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and there is some question about if, if that's the only time they married, there may be some question about whether they are actually legally married because the California Supreme Court said that those marriages were invalid. So. Okay, so I just wanted to flag that. And then I, I also wanted to talk a bit about registered domestic partnerships in California. They are still available. Um, California has had a comprehensive registered domestic partnership scheme, in other words, uh, a scheme that, has, that provides partners with almost all the rights and responsibilities of marriage under state law, including the same right to access step parent adoption procedures. And that's been available since January 2005. Um, Previous to that, California did have a statewide domestic partnership registry starting in um, January 2000. And anybody who registered you know, between um, January 2000 and January 2005 and didn't dissolve their registered domestic partnership acquired all the same rights and responsibilities when um, the more comprehensive registered domestic partnership scheme took effect in 2005. Um, the other thing to be aware of is California will recognize non-marital unions entered into elsewhere. So other states also created um, similar registered domestic partnerships or civil unions. Um, the western states tended to call them registered domestic partnerships, and it's mostly east coast states that call them civil unions. But California will recognize those as long as they are substantially equivalent to a registered domestic partnership. Um, So the Modern Family Act, you know, because of sort of, based on what I said earlier, the importance of adoption, um, part of what the Modern Family Act was meant to address was the fact that, you know, for 
pretty much all same-sex couples and many couples where one spouse is transgender, there's basically no feasible way financially for both um, spouses to be biologically related to their child. So there's always one spouse who, um, you know, we would advise to try to get an adoption. And the Modern Family Act created a streamlined adoption process for step parents um, who were married at the time their child was born to their spouse. Um, because otherwise there would be this kind of cumbersome home study background check um, that you know pretty much all same-sex couples and many couples with the transgender spouse um, were essentially forced to go through if they wanted to be sure that they were protecting the relationship of the non-birth parent to the child. Um, one thing I wanted to note is although, of course, this act took effect on January 1, 2015, the procedure is certainly available to married couples whose children were born before 2015 and haven't gotten an adoption yet. So, um, And then I have just a couple of slides for um, tips for respectful interactions with LGBT people. One is, of course, to just become familiar with terms that um, people in the community might use. And if you interact a lot with people who don't speak or who speak a language other than English, to become familiar with what terms um, people might use in those languages to identify themselves. Um, certainly avoid using terms that people might find stigmatizing or overly clinical, like homosexual um, or tranny, which is this term, uh, unfortunately, you know, this very stigmatizing term used to refer to transgender people. Um, and then don't assume that you can tell what a person's sexual orientation or gender identity is just by how they look or their mannerisms or even who they come into the office with. Um, and then finally, of course, be prepared to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity in a professional, non-judgmental way. Um, and then um, I also want, I included, wanted to include this slide just about talking about LGBT people's families, since this is a presentation about um, the Modern Family Act and about adoption. So the first thing is to just um, you know teach yourself and maybe talk to others in your office about maybe switching to using gender neutral terms to refer to um, people's family members if you don't already know um, what gender they're family member is, so saying spouse or partner instead of assuming that a person has a wife or a husband based on how they present to you. Um, and then also don't assume what family relationships exist until the person shares this information. So if, you know, a couple of people come in and they, you know, you might assume that they're in a couple, don't assume that they're married or don't assume that they are actually a couple, you know, maybe they're siblings or maybe they're just friends and, you know, sometimes unmarried people want to raise a child together as well. Um, whatever the relationship between the two of them. Um, and then if you are asking questions about a person's um, relationship to their child, um, it's often useful to explain why you need to know that information. Um, part of that is just because LGBT people, um, we often face having our relationships with our children questioned um, gratuitously you know, to, to kind of imply that we don't have a real relationship with that child or that our relationship with that child is somehow suspect. Um, so it's always good to explain when you're asking for what can feel like very personal or, uh, you know, very intrusive question, why you need to know that information. So if you need to know if a child um, that is the subject of the adoption has another adult that they're biologically related to, like a sperm donor or a biological father, just explain that that's important um, when filling out the adoption forms and that it's important to know so that the, um, the client or the um, petitioner knows who they need to notify. Um, and then also, when referring to sperm donors or biological fathers, avoid terms and phrases that stigmatize um, the actual parents or erase their family relationships, like don't refer to sperm donors as fathers, um, and don't ask who is the quote-unquote real parent, when what you mean is, you know, who is, is there another person the child is biologically related to or genetically related to. Um, and then again, along similar lines. It's important to explain why you might need to know about any other 
um, formal legal recognition that um, a petitioner has for their relationship. So you need to know whether they're legally married or whether they've actually registered as domestic partners with the state. Um, many LGBT people uh, refer, you know, use words for their relationships like spouse or husband or wife or partner. Um, which may or may not correspond to the legal recognition for their relationship. So it's important to respect the way a person um, regards their own relationship. But of course, for the purposes of um, court filings, it's also important to know what the um, legal relationship between two people is. But it's important to explain why you're asking about that. And then finally, uh, mirroring the terms the person uses to describe their identities and family relationships. So if a person describes themselves as a lesbian, um, even if you think it looks to you that they're in a different sex relationship, you can use that word lesbian to refer to them and maybe don't just switch over to using bisexual, even though you think, well, she's with a man. How could she be a lesbian? Um, and then similarly, mirror the term they use to refer to their family relationships. So if they refer um, to the person they're with as their wife, even if you know in the course of talking with them you realize they're not legally married, um, it's important to still respect the fact that they're using the term wife or husband or spouse, um, while of course letting them know that they cannot um, put down that they're legally married on a court form because it would be, you know, they would be at risk of um, committing fraud if they did. So, um, so that's all for my part. I'll turn it over to Betsy. All right. Thank you, Ming. Um, so I will be going over how to file a step-parent adoption to confirm parentage. Uh, I'll be reviewing the forms um, and also go over the filing procedure. Um, so the Modern Family Act is under Family Code Section 9000.5. Um, I basically provided the entire um, section here on this slide, um, but we'll go through what the requirements are. Um, basically, the 9000.5 provide, uh, provides a simplified process for step, uh, filing a step-parent adoption to confirm parentage. Um, as a lot of you ha have a uh, step-parent adoption experience, I'm sure you're, you know that typically a step-parent adoption requires um, you requesting the court to terminate parental rights of a birth parent. Um, there's a home investigation and a home study required, and you also have to go to a court hearing for the adoption. And for um, step-parent adoptions to confirm parentage, it doesn't require any home study or uh, home investigation. Uh, there's no background check. Um, no court hearing is typically required. And the entire process is usually completed by paper submission. So this is a big um, time and money saver um, in San Francisco. The juvenile probation department usually conducts the home investigation. And it could take months to go through a background check and to complete the home study. Um, the probation department typically charges about $300 to do the home study. Uh, you can go through a private uh, adoption agency if you like, which may have a quicker turnaround time, but um, as far as I know, they charge upwards of some 100 or more for the home investigation. And the other types of step-parent adoption um, cases that our center assists with typically takes around six months or so to get to the adoption hearing point. And that is provided that the applicant is diligent and complies with every step of the process. Um, it could take a much longer if there are other issues like service or there's, there may be issues with the background check. So um, Family Code Section 9000.5 really streamlined the step-parent adoption process for those who qualify. So um, I'm going to go over some of the requirements to qualify to file um, under um, Family Code Section 9000.5. Um, so these are the requirements you have to meet. Um, you must be married or in a registered domestic partnership, um, which also includes a domestic partnership or civil union. Um, in another state, and as Ming previously mentioned, make sure that it's a valid marriage or a valid domestic partnership. Um, 
the child must be born during the marriage or domestic partnership. Uh, you still must be in a registered or domestic partnership at the time of filing. And you also have to uh, provide notice or obtain consent from anyone with a claim to uh, parentage. Um, however, uh, notice is not required if the child is conceived by assisted reproduction in compliance with uh, Family Code Section 7613. Um, a lot of the cases that I've actually assisted with, um, uh, most of the time the parents may be using an anonymous donor at a licensed firm bank or through a licensed physician and they have the documentation to support that. Um, so under Family Code Section 7613, that donor is treated as a non-parent, so you would not have to obtain um, their consent or notify them. However, um, uh, even though Family Code Section 7613 um, says that a, if you use a known donor and you use a licensed sperm bank or a licensed physician for the um, conception, you should still notify um, the donor um, and make sure you refer to them as a donor, not the father, um, that you will be um, filing a step-parent adoption and um, obtain their consent. Uh, if parents are not willing to notify um, the donor, um, they should probably consult an attorney. Um, the reason being, even though um, Family Code Section, I'm, I'm sorry, Family Code Section 9000.5 doesn't require a court hearing, the court can still order a hearing if they believe that there may be an issue of parentage. So it's better that you um, have all of this information up front, so you know um, the applicants aren't blindsided and you know, they thought that they didn't have to go to a court hearing and they might have to end up going to a hearing for the court to look into these issues. Um, so uh, just very briefly, uh, Family Code Section 7613 talks about the assisted reproduction um, process and whether or not a donor is treated as a parent or not. And uh, in order for you to be in compliance with Family Code 7613, um, if you're using an unknown donor, and a licensed physician or a licensed firm bank, um, there's no paternity um, under 7613. So the donor is not treated as a parent. Um, if you do use a known donor, but you use a licensed physician or a licensed firm bank, um, the donor is uh, treated as a non-parent under Family Code Section 7613 unless there is a written agreement prior to the conception to treat the donor as a parent. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you should still notify the donor and obtain their consent even though um, it's not required under 9000.5. Um, however, if you do use a known donor and you didn't go through a licensed physician or a licensed firm bank, then you must have an agreement in place prior to conception or you must obtain the consent of the donor. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about um, the new code section and um, what's required and the process. Um, I'm now going to go through how I typically offer assistance uh, for litigants for filing these type of step-parent adoptions. So, um, usually the way our center provides assistance with these cases is by an appointment. Um, so when a litigant comes through our self-help center during a regular drop-in hours, I provide them with an intake form and I go through what documents they need to gather and prepare for the appointment. Um, and uh, here's a sample of the intake form uh, we use in our center. Um, I also go through how um, the parents need to do the Indian child inquiry during the intake process because both the petitioner and the birth parent will need to sign ICWA forms that get attached to the step-parent adoption um, application. Um, and um, I also provide them with an information sheet on how to do the Indian child inquiry. Um, I also ask them to bring the child's birth certificate their marriage certificate or their domestic partnership certificate, 
and also obtain uh, letters or documentation from the sperm bank or the licensed, uh, licensed physician or um, the written donor agreement. The more they have, the better it is because you'll, all, you'll need all of these documentations um, attached to your filing. And also, uh, once you have all of this information, it's going to help you with preparing the actual form. And it just makes it a lot more convenient that you have all of this information up front but before you actually prepare the forms. Um, the other thing is this intake also helps me to make sure that they actually qualify to file a step-parent adoption to confirm parentage because otherwise if, um, let's just say, the child was born um, before they were married or before they um, registered as domestic partners, then they may have to um, file um, and go through the regular step-parent adoption. Okay, so um, just really quickly, the ICWA forms, um, I listed the ICWA forms that are required. The ICWA 005 info, I find that helpful for litigants um, in terms of helping them do the Indian child inquiry. Um, I usually provide this as homework for them, uh, for them to go home and review. I also, um, at the intake, prepare and uh, populate the ICWA 010 and the ICWA 020 for them to go home and do the inquiry and for them to sign. Um, the adopting parent will be completing the ICWA 010 and signing that, and the birth parent completes the ICWA 020. Uh, so just a quick note, now, um, if you did use an anonymous donor and they just indicated that um, they are Native American, but they didn't specify any tribal affiliation, you don't need to indicate that the child has Indian ancestry on the ICWA forms. Um, so uh, for the Indian Child Inquiry Attachment, that's the um, ICWA 010 form. Um, this is for the adopting parent to complete and sign. If they made the inquiry that um, whether or not the child or the child par uh, child's parent may be an Indian um, child or have Indian ancestry or if they're a member of a tribe or receiving tribal benefits and there's not, um, that doesn't apply to them, uh, on the actual form, you just mark that, uh, that the inquiry was made and you mark under box F that there is no known Indian ancestry and the adopting parent signs this form. Um, for the ICWA 020, uh, the parental notification of Indian status form, this is completed by the birth parent. So it's asking whether the birth parent may have any Indian ancestry. Um, and so um, it's the birth parent's information and they're indicating whether or not they have any Indian ancestry. So if there is none, they mark box D and they sign on the bottom. And um, once they have all of this completed and they have all the information, they return back for a scheduled appointment. Uh, when they come in, I will actually then prepare their entire adoption request um, packet and attach all their necessary forms. So I'm just going to go through really quickly how to actually complete the forms and how a packet would look like and offer some tips that I found um, useful or just things that, um, that come across as an issue for me that um, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of. So um, for the adoption request, it's the Adopt 200 form. It's used for um, all types of adoptions. Um, one of the things I do want to point out is make sure that the name you list for the petitioner on your petition matches their legal documents. <clears throat> so usually I will use the name that's listed on the birth certificate. And this, actually, this issue actually comes up a lot for pro per litigants because um, they may list, you know, they may be using one name when they fill out any other types of forms. They don't necessarily use the name they that's listed on their legal documents. Um, but for your request, make sure it's consistent um, with their legal documents and you write their name the same way throughout all your forms. Okay, so um, this is the adoption request form. 
Okay. Uh, page one of the Adopt 200, uh, part one, just ask for the adopting parent's name and information, their address. Uh, number two is just while you're filing in this court, you're just indicate you can file where the adopting parent resides or where the child was born or reside at the time of filing. Uh, number three, you're indicating what type of adoption you're filing. So for the step parent adoption, you're actually marking that box on page two. You're marking step parent adoption and then you're also marking the little box that says step parent adoption to confirm parentage. <clears throat> Uh, on number four of the form, this is the child's information. Um, you can ask for a new name through the step-parent adoption. Um, most of the cases that I have helped with, um, they already have, um, they're not asking for a new name. And in fact, actually, both the birth parent and the adopting parent are already on the birth certificate. But as Ming mentioned um, earlier, that it's really important for um, um, LGBT parents to have this court order because not all states will recognize um, the birth certificate for parentage, so it's important that they actually have an adoption order that says that they are a parent. Um, so on page three of the adoption request, um, number 12 is very important. Uh, you want to make sure you are marking box C that says, I am seeking a step-parent adoption to confirm parentage. And um, you're also including a declaration that actually both parents will need to complete uh, re uh, that shows that they qualify um, to file um, a step-parent adoption to confirm parentage. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, box number 13, you also want to indicate that, that if there are, um, if the child was conceived by assisted reproduction in compliance with Family Code Section 7613. Um, and page four, there's nothing to fill out. Page five, um, you're just marking that you're asking the court to approve the adoption and then the adoption parent, uh, adopting parent signs. So it's not a very difficult form to fill out. It's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the most important things that I want to make sure is the names are consistent and um, the children's information, the child's information actually matches what's on the birth certificate. Okay. So um, the next form we're going to go through is the ADOPT 205 form. It's the declaration confirming parentage in a step parent adoption. And again, both parents must complete their own ADOPT 205 form. And um, this one is important because it explains the circumstances of the conception and it's going to show whether or not they're in compliance with uh, uh, Family Code 7613. Um, and you want to attach any letters, donor agreements, uh, receipts um, that will uh, explain the circumstances of conception. Um, so here's an example. Um, again, remember, each parent must complete their own, and this gets attached to the adoption request. Um, and this declaration, basically, you're saying that you're, in, you're married or in a registered domestic partnership. They want you to put the date. They also want you to put the child's information and make sure that the child was born during the union. And um, you want to explain the circumstances of consumption to um, make sure that uh, nobody needs to get notice or if somebody does, um, that they're notified and just make the, this will just ensure that there are no parentage issues uh, for the adoption. And um, so this one that I have on the slide, I put the adopting parent, but you would also fill out the same form for the birth parent as well. And um, again, make sure you attach any letters from the sperm bank or licensed physician or any donor agreement to this form. Okay. The next form that you will also need for um, your request is the adoption agreement. That's form ADOPT 210. 
Um, this is signed by both the birth parent and the adopting parent. And since typically no hearing is required, this form is usually signed in front of a notary. So um, under number 4A, that's where the adopting parent will sign. Uh, under 4B is where the birth parent's going to sign. And under number 7 of the adoption request, uh, the birth parent is signing to say that they agree to the adoption. And then on page 3, um, under number 8, you're going to indicate that um, this, was, uh, this form was signed outside of a hearing and that it was signed in front of a notary uh, public. Okay. The last, um, actually, the um, other judicial counsel form that you will need to prepare for litigants is the adoption order. Um, again, make sure you double check spelling of names, make sure everything matches with the request and other legal documents. Um, and on the adoption order, there's not much to it. You're just indicating under number four that the hearing is waived um, under Family Code Section 9000.5. And then on page two of the form, under number 13, you're putting the child's name that you, um, if you are requesting the new name after the adoption, that's where you would put the new name. And the last form you will need to help litigants prepare is the VS44, the court order of the adoption. So this gets sent to Sacramento, uh, California Department of Public Health, to record the adoption. And this form, it's not a judicial counsel form. Um, it just got revised January of this year. So I included the link where you could obtain a copy of this form. Um, for those who use essential forms, this form hasn't been revised on essential forms yet. Uh, so if you need a fillable copy of this form, you can email me and I can forward you a fillable version um, on PDF. Um, now, the important uh, keep in mind that this form is used for uh, the, the California Department of Public Health to record the adoption. And um, it's very important that it has to be signed in black ink and completed in blank ink. And the information you list on this form has to match the original birth certificate in order for um, the California Department of Public Health to accept it. So typically what I do is I make sure I, um, the litigant reviews this form side by side with the original birth certificate to make sure all the information is correct. Um, otherwise, if not, and if you are requesting a new birth certificate, um, they might not issue it, or you might have some issues down the line. And um, let's see, just a couple of final notes um, for um, the step-parent adoption to confirm parentage process. Uh, I have a checklist that I use. Um, here's the checklist to make sure that I have every form that I need as a part of my filing. And this is a good way for me to just make sure that I'm not missing anything. And feel free to adopt this for your office if um, you find this helpful. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, no court hearing is required, so I make sure litigants provide a self-addressed stamped envelope for the court to send them back their adoption uh, order. And um, the filing fee for this process is $20, and they won't have to incur any additional fees since uh, no um, home investigation or home studies required. Um, you want to make sure you make two copies of all the forms you uh, need to file um, when you're uh, submitting it for, to the clerks. And in San Francisco, the usual processing time for this T takes about three to four weeks. Litigants should receive their orders back in about um, three to four weeks. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and just one final note, um, if you do have twins or there's multiple children you need to uh, uh, adopt, each child must have their own separate adoption request. 
So um, in the materials that I believe Lack Cabaret sent you has a sample packet of what I usually submit with the checklist and the intake form and some helpful information as well. So feel free to use that as a sample. And um, that's it on my part. Uh, we're open for any questions right now. And, we, uh, and we've also provided our contact information if anybody has any questions or follow-up comments. Um, yeah, and I wanted to jump in and say, you know, if you do get any petitioners um, or people coming to you who do, who you think do need to speak to an attorney, um, NCLR has a helpline. We're very happy to try to connect people with LGBT-friendly attorneys. We can often, not always, um, find people low-cost or pro bono attorneys, especially for adoptions. Um, where attorneys, family law attorneys, are a little more willing to take those on pro bono compared to contested um, family law actions. So definitely feel free to pass along NCLR's contact information to anybody that you think um, could benefit from some legal advice or help finding an attorney. Okay, hey, so we do have one question. If the couple doesn't need a reissued birth certificate, do they still need to submit a VS-44? Uh, yes, they do. They, and they could just mark on part two of the VS-44 that they don't need a, a new birth certificate reissued. Okay, um, that is the only question we have at this time, but if folks do have questions, please um, enter those questions using your chat box on your control panel. Uh, Ming, I actually have a question for you. Sure. Um, and I wanted to ask you, so, um, you know, I understand that most states might not recognize um, uh, for example, if both parents are already on the birth certificate, why they might not recognize the non-birth parent as having um, uh, uh, parental rights. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why, um, or can you explain the pros and cons of filing a, an adoption to confirm parentage versus filing a paternity action? Sure. Well, I mean, I think one kind of practical advantage to doing a step-parent um, adoption to confirm parentage is that every state is very, fam you know, courts in every state are familiar with adoptions. And they may be a little less familiar with parentage actions or paternity actions when it's a same-sex couple filing them, because in some states, paternity actions really mean an action to determine who is a biological parent, and that state's law is um, very focused on who is genetically related to the child. Um, so in some states, as a practical matter, it might be a little confusing if you show up and what you have is a paternity action, and a judge is looking at it and thinking, well, how could you have prevailed on a, you know, how could you have been found to be a parent in a paternity action um, or a parentage action um, when you're clearly, you clearly cannot be um, a genetic parent to this child. Um, so I think that's sort of one practical reason to go for a um, step-parent adoption instead of a parentage judgment. Um, I mean, but you know, obviously it's a case-by-case -case, um, assessment. For some people it might make sense to get um, a parentage judgment and not a uh, not an adoption, and, and they should obviously talk to an attorney to decide which one. I mean, one situation might be if they're a little uncomfortable um, with some, some people have an objection to um, characterizing what they're doing as an adoption because they feel like they're already and correctly feel that they're already a legal parent to the child. So why should they have to go through something called an adoption? Um, and it is true that legally, um, a parentage judgment and an adoption should be afforded the exact same recognition. They're both court judgments um, finding somebody to be a parent. And they do have to be recognized um, in all other states. But just as a practical matter, if a couple is able to get an adoption, that's often what we um, recommend. Thank so. you so much for that clarification. Yeah. 
But that's a great question, and, and actually something that we get asked a lot by couples trying to decide between the two um, options. So Ming and Betsy, we have another question that just came in. How do you notice the sperm donor? Do you serve a copy of the adoption request and file proof of service? draft a citation for freedom from parental custody and control? Um, you know, I don't believe that the code section requires formal notice. I think that um, if you submit a, um, like, a citation or a uh, uh, application for, uh, to, um, uh, to terminate the parental rights or um, uh, application to free the child for um, for adoption might be confusing for the court. I would put it in the um, declaration um, surrounding um, to confirm the parentage that I notified the uh, the donor on this specific date that I will be filing a step parent adoption. Um, and as previously, uh, we've never done an agreement to uh, uh, to for that donor to intend to be um, a parent. And I think that should be sufficient. Um, Ming, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's true. And you know, the the only reason, and I have to say, I, I add, I, we were the ones who sort of added that to that slide. It's just from an overabundance of caution, um, may, maybe from too many years of working in in many states where um, courts are very hostile to LGBT parents and seeing things like sperm donors showing up and claiming that because they were never properly noticed, they get to challenge um, a final <laughs> adoption. Um, that you know, it's good to have something in the record showing that, in fact, the sperm donor was aware that this adoption was happening, so they can't come back later and say, um, I mean, at the very least aware, hopefully they'll say, you know, not only am I aware, I, I consent to, or uh, I'm completely fine with this adoption, um, so that it kind of forecloses that uh, argument later on. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think this would ever gain any traction in California. We, uh, we're, or really legally anywhere else, but but that's just a worry that we have. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think yeah. if you have um, the written consent and you attach it, I think that should be sufficient as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't have any further questions at this time. Um, yeah. If. A, if if folks do have, well, we can take one final question if anyone wants to take this time to, to enter a question in their chat box. And seeing none, I will go ahead and thank you um, both Betsy and Ming for, to, for today's webinar, Step Parent Adoption Under the Modern Family Act. Um, thank you so much for presenting today. We will, following this training, we will review um, in session times for all participants and distribute both MCLE materials and a link to the recording in the coming days. We hope that you all join us for our next training, which is called Technology Access on Tuesday, um, April 5th, so this coming Tuesday. This webinar is part of the 2016 Disability Civil Rights Law Series, and it will offer practical tips and resources for ensuring electronic document accessibility in our communications with courts, counsel, clients, and others. And this training is appropriate for all staff at legal services organizations to attend. To register, visit www.laaconline.org and select Upcoming Trainings. The Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC, is the membership organization for IOLTA-funded nonprofits. Our job is to advocate on behalf of California legal services community. In addition to our webinar programs, we hold in-person trainings throughout the year in California, and we would love to meet you in person. You can find more information about this and other trainings on our website at lacconline.org or by following us on Facebook. You can also email us at trainings at lacconline.org with any questions. And with that, thank you again, Ming and Betsy, and thank you all for your time this afternoon. We hope to see you at an upcoming training. Thank you, Denise.
Yeah, and thanks, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you.